We were created in the year 1 AD. We're, we're an old department, and the department has changed significantly over time. And at one point, the department focused on educational psychology. It merged as time went along. So we've been in existence for several decades in various um, iterations. The department as it stands right now, in some ways, is new in terms of the, pers the particular perspective that we're taking. And we've grown significantly in the last 10 years in terms of the, the sheer size of the faculty. So right now, we have 35 full-time faculty and a host of adjunct faculty who are here to sort of support the intellectual life of the department. So we are an old department in many ways, but new enough that we'll, we can do some transformative stuff, and we do. In various ways, health psychology is um, sort of merged in. We have um, faculty who are from a variety of places. We have a sexologist on, on our, uh, in our department. We have someone who does ASL. We have people who have come in from various disciplines, which enriches the kind of intellectual work that we do. And that's been the tradition of the department and will continue to be the, tr the tradition of the department over time. There are members of our community who do translational research. The, the question of applied psychology simply is, is this broad. Mm -hmm. You have, again, you have some scholars who are interested in simply thinking about ideas, which is really valuable. We do that. But the question is, if we're going to think about, for example, the relationship between language and culture, you can theorize about how those things might intersect. Mm -hmm. but. For the faculty in our department, the question is, how do you begin to study that and with whom? And under what conditions are some assumptions true but not others, and how do we begin to test that? And once we test it, the question is, what are the implications? Can we go out and do anything with this information that will really have an impact on children's lives or adults' lives? Trans that in part, that can be translational research. But translational research is only one component of the kind of work that we do. For the counseling program in particular, it's an important component of the work that, that you will do. And so one of the things that is going to be important for our faculty as they go through the admissions process is raising the question for any student, what would it be like for anyone to sit in front of the student in a therapeutic context? Is this someone who understands what that dynamic would look like and how do they understand it? What, what's their preparation been? It's not absolutely central. So people who will have different kinds of experience that will, that will have clinical meaning. So if you have been a peer counselor, for example, um, or a tutor, and you can talk about the ways in which your understanding of someone else's experience of learning has impacted the way that you work with them, that helps us to understand what you would be like as a, a potential therapist. So you don't actually have to have had um, experience as a therapist coming in, but we do want you to talk a little bit about how you understand other people's experience, the extent to which you can be self-reflective, which is very important. So all of those kinds of things need to be raised as a part of the admissions, your admissions packet. It will never hurt you. <laughs> and we, we do understand as a faculty that Many students are coming out of context where they may not have had the kind of mentorship that would have led to them being able to be a part of a, a, um, pu of a publication process. So the expectation is not going to be that you will have a record of, of publication coming in the door. If you have, you should ha certainly highlight that. But it is important because a PhD really is a research degree that you, you demonstrate in as many ways and to the level of detail that you can the kind of research experiences that you have had, even if they, those experiences haven't led to a publication. Have you been a part of a research team? Have you presented at conferences? All of those things certainly will matter. When you look at our faculty, our faculty does an incredible array of work. And so you have faculty who are here who do profoundly detailed, wonderful, qualitative work and people who are equally good at doing quantitative work. So no, we don't have a bias towards either one. And actually, in a number of the programs, you're required to do both. It's not essential that you have taken statistics. If you have taken it, it is essential that you did well. <laughs> but you will, if you have not taken statistics, then when you are, when you are invited into the program, the expectation is that 
if you're not familiar with some of the basic concepts, you would be required to take an, an elementary course so that you can um, increase your competence in that area. And the, because of the nature of the program, you, you really are going to be required to be as adept at quantitative methodology as qualitative, but you can choose whichever one you're going to specialize in because all of us ask different questions, and the question you ask drives the methodology that you use to answer it. We don't make that kind of distinction. We use what's called the Boulder model, and the Boulder model assumes that the best intellectual training that one can receive in the social sciences, but particularly in psychology, requires that you're as good at the, the intervention component of your work as in the, um, the research component of your work. So there is a real balance. So all of our programs are research oriented. The counseling program is a balance of clinical work and, um, and research, but you really do do both. And research is wonderful, it's actually fun. <laughs> the PSI program, the Psychology and Social Intervention program is 72 credits. The Psychological Development program is also 72 credits. The Counseling program is 96. And, um, but the, the number of credits that you actually complete when you're in the program is determined by your previous experience. So if you're transferring credits in, that will lower the number of credits that, that you'll need to take. But that's something that will be decided with your advisor. Actually, we do a little bit of a mix. The, the, historically, each program has had its own admissions committee. And that admissions committee makes decisions about who the students are who will either be invited for interviews, and then ultimately the final uh, three or four candidates who will be invited to join the, the class for the next year. But added to your, your question is a question that we think about in terms of um, mentorship as opposed to admissions. And the mentorship process, when students are invited into the department, we do a little bit of what I think about as a sort of mixed method approach to mentorship. We understand that students will make decisions early on about what they think they want to study. And so when you're, when you're invited into the, each class, you're invited in, linked into an advisor or a mentor who will guide your research or guide you towards someone who is consistent enough with your research interests that it might be a, a good fit. And as John mentioned earlier, the question of fit is essential. If you want to study how shoes ultimately impact the happiness of human beings, we have no one who studies that, so this is not a good program. But if you want to study things about social emotional development, et cetera, and about culture and context, there are a number of faculty who do that. So we would link you into a faculty member, or you can say, I want to work with the great Dr. LaRue Allen. And Dr. Allen will certainly look over your application, and if it seems like a good fit, you might be one of the people who is invited in for, to, to be a part of, of her research team. But we also recognize that you're going to be in graduate school for five to six years. And in that time, it's important for you to get a breadth of experience. So you are not chained to a faculty member for the rest of your life. When you come in, you can work with Dr. Grossman and you can work with Dr. Suzuki simultaneously. Or you can work with Dr. Grossman and decide you've come to an end and you can move on to another faculty member. The goal is for you to become the best you that you can be at the end of five years. We, we don't believe in the idea that you do transformative work by echoing what has already gone before. That's not our model. The question of what's, our, what's the ethos, essentially, of our, the relationship between our students. There are some programs that really emphasize competitiveness among students as a mechanism for um, making sure that students are as well prepared as they think students should be. That is not us. This, the, our expectation, certainly for students, but also for faculty, is that collaboration works far better than competition. So, which is one of the reasons why you have the latitude to work with multiple faculty. So you are probably not going to find a lot of competition among the faculty, especially unhealthy competition. So the students follow suit. Students work together. The three people or four people who are part of your cohort are with you for years. This is going to be your family. You take your classes with them, you eat with them, you love them, they love you back. You study for comps with them. Everything that you're going to do, you're going to do with the people in not, not only your immediate program cohort, but your class across the various programs. So the expectation is that we're going to bring people in who understand that community gets built and knowledge, knowledge is not an individual enterprise, not solely. It really 
comes out of community, and our expectation is that you will work that way. The answer to the first question is yes. There are circumstances under which an expert in the field is in another institution, and one of the ways in which that, there are a couple of ways that those people can be integrated in. Faculty may have collaborative relationships with um, folks who are experts in various areas, and by virtue of being on a research team, those people are a part of the intellectual environment that you're exposed to on a regular basis. In some cases, when students are studying for, are preparing their dissertation, for example, there might be an outside scholar who is an expert in some dimension of the work, and you have the latitude to include that person as a member of your committee. And it's a, a fairly straightforward pro process to have that happen. The local community, various faculty have various kinds of relationships with the local community. There are faculty who are in schools locally and do research in schools. There are faculty, um, for example, our faculty, um, one of our faculty members, Christy McWain, does a lot of work with Head Start. And she's in um, Head Start in Brooklyn, Queens, uh, the Bronx. So depending on the faculty member that you're working with and the kind of work that they happen to do, you may be in various communities locally. Under certain circumstances, we do. And the, there is no particular bias against NYU students. It is important, though, and this is true for any institution, it is important that you have a breadth of experience as an intellectual. And so for students who did their undergraduate work and master's work here, one of the questions that we would have naturally is, what inspires that student to want to stay here? For some students, it's a matter of comfort. That is not a good intellectual reason to stay at an institution. If there is fit, then it, you're as much a part of the pool as anyone else. So we do have students in, in various years who are from NYU.